Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to the second session of the Health Econ uh, Luncheon Series. Just to recap a little bit as to about um, to put this session in context. So last week, Professor McCabe had talked about Econ Eval, right? He talked about that that Econ Eval is defined as a comparative analysis of at least two competing choices in terms of both costs and outcomes. That if you only look at costs, it's not an Econ Eval. Um, so through the series, we're going to deal with both costs and outcomes later, but this is why we're dealing with costs first. We're going to deal with the first component of the econ eval, which is costs. And so we have uh, two great speakers today. So Nathan, your, your very own Nathan from the Health Economics and Funding Branch at Alberta Health, will give a, a bit of an orientation, talk about uh, hospital costing. And then following his talk, we're going to have Lisa Pilon from um, Finance at Alberta Health Services. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm not going to read out all their bios. You have it with you. I'm going to invite uh, Nathan to the podium to give his talk. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Really nice to be here. A little terrifying, but that's okay. I think it'll, it'll still be good. So thanks, everyone, for having me. Um, before I dive in, I want to give a thanks to my team. Uh, a lot of my team members, Jim, Imming, and uh, Edward, all contributed a bit to this presentation, so I just want to thank them for their contributions as well, too. They might be watching on a live stream. Ed Edward, Edward's here today, but, uh, but either way, I just wanted to make sure that uh, their contributions were acknowledged. When I was asked to prepare something for this session, I thought about, okay, how can I contribute to a discussion around hospital costs? And so really how I wanted to frame this is, what are different ways to explore hospital expenditures in Alberta? So what I'd like to do today is uh, provide a little bit of provincial context. Uh, really my goal is to give people tools to look at this information in a different way. Some of them will be familiar to people. I, I suspect that some individuals will be familiar with some of these items, but not, I think some will be new for people. I want to highlight exactly what these various resources are, um, what kind of information they can provide, and how would I approach using these resources, and when would I use them as well. Um, one of the key challenges with this type of information is that a lot of the information at a very high level is really about Alberta Health Services expenditures, not about hospital-specific expenditures. And of course, Alberta Health Services expenditures are much broader. They, they operate in many more things than just hospitals. So I'll try to identify that context uh, for those various uh, items. So I wanted to start with some provincial context. This won't be uh, new for some people, but for others, just to provide uh, a frame for this. So I went and took a look at the quarter one forecast that was just released for 1617 and kind of rolled up the uh, operating expenses by various ministries. So you, and, I, and I grouped any of the ministries that were uh, less than 10% of the operating expenditures. So you have advanced education around 12%, education at about 17, human services is 10, health is at 43% of operating expenses, and uh, all the other ministries together are about 18% of operating expenses. So when we take that and look more specifically at Alberta Health's operating forca forecast, the expense forecast, you see that we're, you know, we've got lots of different components that we fund, but AHS receives about 60.5% of our funding. And if you work that back to the provincial operating expenses, you know, when we're talking about funding AHS, we're really talking about 27%, give or take, of uh, provincial operating expenses, which is a greater expenditure than most of the other ministries as well, too. So that's, that's just a bit of framing. You know, this, is, this is why this is so important. It's a very significant expenditure, but how do we unpack this? So I have four items that I've kind of flagged for discussion today. This isn't an exhaustive list. I think there are others, but with the 20 minutes or so I've been allotted, this is organized from high level of detail down to lower level, more detailed analytical options as well, too. So we have uh, first the Canadian Institute for Health Information's National Health Expenditure Report. AHS's financial statements, uh, something people may not be familiar with, management information system data, and then finally patient costing data. And then uh, Lisa will really build on that and give more detail about that in her presentation. So we begin with Kaihai's National Health Expenditure Report. So every year, Kaihai releases uh, this report. And so the report is an interprovincial comparison of health expenditures. So what Kaihai does is they actually break this, you know, provincial health expenditures into various categories. There is a hospitals category, there is a physicians category, drugs, and so on and so forth. Some of these groups are much broader than just AHS, and uh, in how they define hospitals, their expenditures, their result may be a little bit different than some of the other that we run into as well. Um, it's extremely high level. The expenditures they work with to develop this report are based off of public accounts reporting. So it's very high level of detail, very rolled up. They try to say this is what we believe aligns with hospital expenditures. Nonetheless, there are some key strengths and in information in here that's quite useful. First, it's historically comparable. So it goes back to 1975. 
there are very few data sets that have that kind of history in them. If you want to do long-term analysis on like how have expenditure growth rates changed over time in Canada and between provinces. The data is in aggregate, so it is not specific. It doesn't go down to the facility level. It doesn't go down to the patient level. This is aggregated expenditures for a specific jurisdiction. Within that, they pro provide some break, further breakdowns of the data. When you see in the media a lot of discussion of per capita health expenditures, often this is the source for that information because it does present per capita health expenditures for different jurisdictions across Canada. They also break the health expenditures down by age groups, by gender. One of the things that I think is a little bit interesting is that the data is broken down. First, there are some private sector health spending estimates included in there as well too. And they also have estimates for different levels of government. So they do compare federal funding, uh, federal expenditures on health, municipal and provincial. They separate these out a bit. But really, this is the best source of information when someone is looking for an interprovincial comparison at that high level. So th there's a few ways you can look at it, but what I wanted to highlight today, and I'm going to try and try and focus on this is uh, our team, specifically the health economics team in our branch, did a great job in taking Kaihai's data they release every year, which is available. You can get the download, the detailed Excel files, as well as the report itself, and do your own analysis. But we've built a dashboard based on this. So here's an example of uh, hospital sector costs. So in our dashboard, which I have a link to in the back of the presentation, you can see for the various provinces, what are the per capita expenditures for this specific sector, I chose 99 to 2015 for this example, so you can see during this period, Alberta's expenditure growth rate was 6.5% on average for hospitals, easily compared to the national average and to other provinces and jurisdictions as well too. It also has a breakdown in the year you've, in 2015, which you, could, which you can choose to say, okay, well, we spent about 45.6% based on Kaihai's definitions on hospitals, 21.8% on physicians, and so on and so forth. So, if you are receiving a request to very quickly say, well, how do these growth rates compare over time? What are different provinces doing? This is a great way to, we've already done a lot of this analytical work for you, and you get to choose yourself in the dashboard um, what years you want to look at the growth rates for. So it's really flexible in that way. The other thing I want, and of course I've noticed a typo, which always happens when you actually get to the, uh, get to the presentation. This is a health expenditures in aggregate, not just hospitals. So it's not per capita, I apologize, that should be per capita. We chose multiple provinces, so we've got a comparison of Alberta, Canada, Ontario, and BC's tucked in there as well too, from 1975 to, uh, it's forecast out to 2016, 2017, showing the average granular growth rate. So on a per capita basis, 6.6% versus a national average during that period of 6.1%. But again, it provides a nice way to see you know, you can see the kind of changes that happened in various provinces in the, in the 90s, how has the, growth, has the curve changed over time, things like this. So I think it's, it's a really nice way for, some, for you to present this kind of analysis uh, when these requests come forward. Something that some people are probably familiar with is AHS's own financial statements. And so people are probably wondering, well, why am I presenting financial statements today? Well, it actually connects to some of the data sources we're going to be talking about a little bit later as well. So the financial information in these statements are, of course, audited, so it's very high quality. Um, you can get them either within the annual report or download them separately. Some of the information I think is particularly useful is uh, expenditures by function, which is in the statement of operations. But the last two I don't think people are as aware of. One's called the expenses by object, which actually breaks down things like how much did AHS spend on their budget for salaries, contracts with other providers, things like that. The last one, which uh, I think people are less familiar with as well too, is there's actually a consolidated salaries and benefits schedule, which has, key, has FTE counts for key disciplines and associated expenditures for those as well too. So it's a few statistics I think that may, people may not have been as aware of. So looking at the uh, statement of operations first, and this is straight out of uh, Alberta Health Services annual 1516 annual report. They break the expenditures down by functions. They say, okay, for inpatient nursing services, this is our expenditure level, emergency and outpatient services and so on, really breaking it down across the functions of the health system. These categories are actually defined by Alberta Health, which I'll talk a little bit about how that's done later on, but we specify what types of expenditures should be reported under these categories by AHS. <coughs> the expenses by object, again, you're able to see very quick from the annual report, from AHS's annual report again, the salaries and benefits, 55% of expenditures were on salaries and benefits, 17% were contracts with health service providers and so on. It's a little different way to understand, you know, what are the individual components and from, that are driving expenditures within AHS's budget, which contributes towards hospital costs, of course, as well, too. The last one, and I apologize, this table is not very clear. 
um, on the slide. It was the best I could do. I apologize for that, though. This actually has FTE counts by various groups and expend base salary expenditures, benefits, and so on and so forth. So we want to drill down. We saw on the previous slide about 55% was being expended on salaries and benefits. What does that break out on? So you can see approximately 4,700 FTE worth of uh, licensed practical nurses, uh, just under 19,000 FTE worth of uh, registered nurses, uh, registered psychiatric nurses, and so on. So you can start to see a little bit of the workforce information that's not people have a little bit of harder time getting access to sometimes, and it is publicly available and included in those financial statements. The pieces that I think some people will be less familiar with in my presentation today is, is really this one. Uh, it's Management Information System Data. So, we, and I'll, I'll use the acronym MIS uh, through our discussion today. So what this is, is so CHI-HI again sets a national standard that says health services organizations, when you're collecting your financial data and you're collecting certain types of statistical information, this is how you collect it, this is how you group and aggregate your information. And that is then reported to Alberta Health at a facility level and at a sub-facility level as well too. So every year we receive this information and CHI-HI does some more analysis and indicators with it as well too. As I alluded to before, this breakdown of the system, if you will, um, is what we use to actually say what types of expenditures should go under what line item. So in that statement by function, the uh, me, statement of operation, those functions are defined. So we actually know what categories of expenditures are going under each of those buckets based upon the functional center codes and the accounting codes that are defined through this standard. So our primary use of this data right now is to define and, uh, and structure, help AHS with the structuring of their financial reporting. The data itself is not publicly available in a raw data form for a couple of reasons. First, even though the data is aggregated, some facilities are very small. This has compensation information in it. This has key activity data on it. It's not hard for this information to be potentially identifiable. So there's some privacy issues that need to be addressed around this before that type of information could be made public. The other challenge is that this is structured, the data is structured from an accounting perspective around a function and, and from a health services management perspective, which is a little bit different than a lot of other data sets are structured. So if you wanted to look at a certain type of expenditures, you actually have to think about where in the system it's distributed, it, it actually has occurred. So if you wanted to look at mental health expenditures, you have to go in and say, okay, well, I want to look first at ones that are delivered in a community setting. And then you have to go somewhere else to find expenditures that are delivered in a, facil in a, in a facility setting, and so on and so forth. So it, it's, it's, it's quite logical once you're familiar with the system, but for, for people who are less familiar with how the data is structured and work, it's a little harder to work with. Even though the raw data isn't publicly available, uh, CHI-HI does use this data and does publish key indicators on it. So the cost of a standard hospital stay, which is a pretty important indicator that gets published and gets a lot of attention every year, um, is based off of MIS data. And as well, the percentage of health expenditures spent on administration is another key indicator uh, that is based on this information. So I've talked about it in the abstract, so what kind of information is actually in this, in this data set? So again, in aggregate, uh, revenues, expenditures and items such as salaries, benefits, food, sessional payments, and other items are in this data set. In terms of statistical information, there are accounts of earned hours, hours of sick leave, vacation, visits, procedures. So the types of procedures, so it does not differentiate by the type of procedure. It will say, you'll be able to identify a nursing inpatient unit or a specific surgical unit did a certain number of procedures. So you'd be able to infer from the type or the area of the hospital where that, that, that procedure was performed, but it doesn't say exactly what procedure was being performed. It also includes information, uh, aggregate counts on births and deaths and so on. So the lowest, so that the lowest level data, and Lisa will get into this in much more detail than I will, is patient costing. Um, so patient costing data, first off, it's not collected in every facility in Alberta. It's only collected in 18 facilities in Alberta, and those facilities are just in the Edmonton and Calgary zones. The other challenge is that not every jurisdiction in Canada actually submits patient costing data. So when I'm talking about patient costing, what I mean is if you went in and you had a, uh, a heart transplant, this would be the full hospital costs around what was involved from a nursing, you know, nursing services, any supplies that were required, specialized drugs, so on and so forth. What is required around that entire episode or event, that would be costed out. But not every facility does it and not every province does it. In fact, Alberta and Ontario are the two jurisdictions that are submitting the majority of the, of the patient costing data nationally. Nova Scotia is, is in the process or just starting to submit this data and BC only does a very little bit of data in one facility now as well too. But it's much, much more detailed than any of the other kind of cost data that we have. 
So the type of information that, that exists within this is collected through this system um, is, as I mentioned, you know, cost per episode. So if you have that kind of health event, what it, the cost is down at the patient level. Of course, that information at that level isn't made available publicly. It's all aggregated for public distribution, but uh, the data does exist down to that level. They try to group clinically similar patients together, and these Creatively enough, they call them groupers, um, to try and identify these patterns. And you'll see in some of the counts I have in subsequent slides, they'll say there's many different types of births that are categorized. They've tried to differentiate them based upon um, how they're clinically similar and identify those key differences to separate them for analysis. This data also helps with expected length of stay calculations, of course, for inpatient cal cases only, and also the resource intensity weight, which is basically exactly what it says, is how how complex or how intense, how much resources were consumed to provide that service for a specific individual. So what's not in here, and this often surprises people, is physician claims payment data is not in here. It's in fact best to think of the costing data, the patient costing data, as not including physician payments. There is a small, very small proportion of uh, physician payments that are rolled in. Uh, it is in the tens of millions of dollars, which is nowhere near the four, four and a half billion dollars or so that Alberta spends on physicians each year. So it's, it's not material within the context of this data set. So it's best to be understood again that it does not include physician payment data in these costs. So I wanted to provide some examples of different types of groupers, separated them into inpatient and ambulatory. So, um, and these are available publicly on our interactive health data application, which I've also provided a link to uh, in the back of my presentation. So I ordered these by volume real quick. So you can see there's different types of births, like with anesthetic, was it a cesarean section, rehabilitations in there, convalescence, other things like that as well too. There are hundreds of groupers, so there's quite a lot of information here. On the ambulatory side, telephone visits, physical therapy, hemodialysis, disease or disorder of the ear, nose, and throat, so on and so forth. This type of, these, ty these are the kind of the clinical groupers that are available. If you were to pull this up, the type of information you'd be able to, to pull from the, the IHDA is first again, I want to emphasize it's aggregated, um, but you can look at these information at a provincial or a zone level. Um, you can pull the activity volume, costs are available for the mean, the median, the 90th percentile, so you can start to see you know, well, like how different from the average was the cost of this specific service. Typical and atypical cases are differentiated as well too. They're a little bit outside the norm. What Kai has a mathematical calculation they do to identify when a case is not typical, which I don't recall the math on off the top of my head. But just basically to say like what is a case with nor normal expectations versus a little bit different. And also, which is really important, uh, is what proportion of the cases are actually costed. So you can see, you know, because we don't have all facilities in Alberta doing costing, only a portion. How many of these records actually have this level of detail? How many are using an estimate instead to do those kinds of cost comparisons? So uh, it's pretty interesting that way. So when would I suggest to use each of these resources? So uh, Kai High National Health Expenditures, if you're doing any kind of interprovincial comparison, it's, a, it's, it's the best starting point, in my opinion. It has some limitations, but the historical data that's available um, makes it incredibly useful. You can either use Kaihai's published information, or I'd encourage you to take a look at our dashboards, because it might shortcut some of your analysis and help you with that. HS's financial statements, I think they're extremely useful if you're trying to look at trends by those functional centers and groupings and publish statistics to try and see how those changed over time. And of course, it's publicly available as well. MIS data, uh, it's not publicly available, but indicators based on it are available. Um, but if you're trying to do any kind of facility comparisons or sub-facility comparisons on expenditures, this is really the best type of data set to inform that type of analysis. Finally, patient costing data. Uh, again, aggregated data is available publicly. Kaihai also has a patient cost estimator on their website, so you could use that, theirs or you could use our interactive health data application to look at the cost either in Alberta or again nationally as well too for these various groupers. Um, and really again, it's a detailed look at the non-physician costs of a specific procedure in a hospital setting. Um, and there's some community stuff too, but it's, it's mostly in a hospital setting. So yeah, that's my presentation. Thank you. So we'll do Lisa's presentation next, and then we'll take questions. Oh, here, can I steal that? Can I steal the mic?
Lisa, are you ready to present? We're ready for you. Hi, Lisa, we are ready for you whenever you are. Okay, I unmuted myself. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Excellent, thank you. Okay, thanks everyone for um, allowing me to participate in this, um, these lunch and learn sessions. So, probably I'm, everyone can see my screen. I'm just going to put on the whole screen here. I didn't have to hear Nathan speak, but I have seen his part of the presentation. So, we're trying to make this flow. So, um, if I'm repeating myself, I apologize. But what Nathan presented was a very hot, more of a, what I call a high-level picture uh, with the provincial, uh, provincial expenses, provincial costing. What I'm going to present is a little bit more specifically related to the hospital, um, within the hospital itself. I will know what Nathan would have presented. presented. So hospital costing. So why would we cost that? Um, one of the reasons would be an understanding of hospital costs at a more detailed level than just overall budget, overall cost. So it helps with understanding the impact of community service delivery. So if we understand the cost within the hospital, we know that it's a community service delivery. What's the impact on the cost? Are they going higher? Are they going lower? That type of thing. It also helps with link between cost drivers and cost. So it's very important to understand at the detail level what our main cost drivers are. So if we want to change something, what are what are the cost drivers within the underlying sort of activity or workload that is driving the cost in the place? It helps us make the right decisions to achieve cost savings. So we don't necessarily always just want to uh, reduce costs. If we're doing it properly, the goal is to reduce costs and achieve cost savings, but do it in a strategic way that's good for everyone, not just to just reduce the cost in general. It then helps us understand and assess value for money of what we do in the hospital, and it can help set fees for revenue and recovery. Here's some examples. I'm sure you guys in your background have uh, other ideas or other ways that you are or could use hospital costing as well. So that's really just general ideas. So we really have, I'm, what I'm presenting today is really two, two ways uh, to prevent or do hospital costing is what I would call, we call patient case costing. And the other term for that is really micro-costing, activity-based costing. And that's the one that I'll talk about first. It's the more detailed granular level of costing. What patient case costing does is it tracks each individual case in their journey to the state. So it takes a very one particular patient, attaches direct and indirect costs um, to that patient as they go through the hospital, and arrive at a full cost. And to get those costs tasked to patients, there are various methodologies. We use workload, statistics, actual, or estimates. Uh, a lot of that depends on what's available to us to work with. By doing patient case costing, it helps us understand what the key drivers are for hospital costs and where savings may be achieved. And we traditionally, uh, you guys know this, it's not just in uh, uh, health that we do this type of thing. This is, would be traditionally known more in just costing role as activity-based costing. Or what we're doing is we're tying specific activities done in the hospital to, their specific, to a specific patient. And this is just a bit of a visual of uh, one, say, patient at site uh, and how, this is, how we have patient costing may be done. So we start with, we allocate all the overhead. So these are just some examples of the allocated overhead. So we might allocate um, linen, nutrition, indirect supervision, general administration, and those would be allocated out to what we call the direct cost functional centers, or to the direct cost. So they get allocated to the direct cost first. And those are allocated in primarily different business roles. So for example, nutrition might be allocated out to the direct cost using patient days. So we try to find a statistic or a business rule that best mimics how those costs should be tied to the direct cost. Then once those are allocated, we have, they're allocated to the direct cost. Some examples of direct costs 
would be things like nursing costs, lab, AI, rehab. And those are then allocated out to come to a unit cost um, using various methods of workload. So for example, for nursing, we might use uh, calculation of nursing workload. Um, for DI, they use, um, for example, they use minutes. So there's various ways of using workloads to then allocate out the cost to the specific patient. And then what you get, these examples are just very, so for example, if you take site A and you have three different patients, a cost of a hip procedure for that patient at site A, one patient might cost $9,000, one might cost $9,500, one might cost $8,500. They might be different because one stays longer in the hospital, one uses more nursing services, um, one uses uh, a more expensive hip, uh, one needs more rehab. So that's where activity-based costing really comes down to that actually shows the difference in cost patient by patient. And then from there, we have what I would consider uh, more macro costing, standard costing, average costing. There's various terminologies out there. Um, one of the terminologies that you hear in Alberta about uh, health or health services in general across Canada is the term, term, terminology of cost for the standard hospital stay. So that is a good alternative where patient case costing does not exist. And what this does is instead of taking the cost for every patient like you saw for patient case costing, it takes an average price per patient per site or procedure. So what it would do, as an example, you could take total costs within the walls of the hospital, uh, <coughs> divided by the number of patients. You could use full cost, partially allocated cost. The total cost that you decide to use is really up to what the purposes you're going to do for. You could use just the cost in the walls of the hospital. You could use provincial costs. It really becomes the purpose of what you're using for. And then what we do is we add a resource intensity weight to it to make them comparable. And I, from seeing Nathan's slide, and I couldn't see them today, I think he, he went over a bit on the RIW and resource intensity weight. But I'll show you a little bit more how that would look like on the slide and slide. So here's an example of what standard cost of the hospital stage is visually. Three dollars in cost in 2,000 patients. But in site B, you might have, for example, $10 million in cost in 1,500 patients. But in the end, the average cost per patient or by procedure might be $5,000 each. So then the question has to become, how can site A and site B have the same cost per patient if we're not seeing that in the boxes? And the reason being, I'm sure some of you are familiar with, is what we call the resource intensity weight. So it evens out the weight of a patient so they're apples to apples. So if you have in site A, um, or if you have in site B, less patients with the same cost, they might be more complex patients. Um, and then what the RIW intensity weight does is it evens out the complexity so that you actually have a more light to light comparison site by site. And then of course, there's not just standard hospital cost, that's one average cost. There's also patient cost, case costing. However, there's other costs that you may not want the full cost when you're looking at a hospital. You may want to, for example, be costing out specific individual hospital services that have nothing to do with the full cost of the patient or the full cost of the procedure at all. Um, you may want to be costing out diagnostic agents. You might want to be costing out lab, pharmacy. Uh, even those are included in patient case costs, in some cases, based on what they're doing, you might want to just be costing on specific hospital services in general. You might want to be costing on physician services, whether that's in the hospital, what they do in the hospital, attached to the patient, that type of thing. So besides just going and costing on a whole procedure or a whole patient, you may also just want to be costing on individual services within that hospital. Um, Activity-based funding. The only reason this is really coming from the funding side. I threw in this slide because a lot of what we're doing right now in Alberta Health is providing the patient case costing for activity-based funding initiatives. And that's been quite a bit in Ontario. Ontario has quite a bit of activity funding-based funding where what they're doing 
is their funding per procedure. So they might be funding, we'll give you $10,000 for every hip procedure you do. We'll give you $10,000 for every knee procedure that you do. And we're starting to do a little bit of that at Alberta Health Services. And the great thing is, is that the patient case costing, or even the standard costing that you saw before, it can be used to support the funding model by giving the underlying cost structure to match the funding. And the purpose of activity-based funding is to promote specific behaviors, to improve service <coughs> delivery, and to improve the patient's experience. And I won't go through this in detail, but really what it's showing you is some of the various uh, costs and benefits of micro-costing versus macro-standard costing. So for example, micro-costing uh, is what you saw with the patient case costing. It's much more detailed. However, uh, it takes a lot more work, a lot more resources. The more granular get in looking at it, and the more you go and carry things, going to flush up money and errors that could actually be a distraction to the decision making. Macro costing uses higher levels, uh, more averages, smaller errors. Um, micro costing takes more time to produce, of course. Macro costing can be done uh, less expensive with a quicker turnaround. Micro costing is lots of detailed data collection. Now, the more detailed you get in data collection, the more you're lot, uh, um, likely to get accurate, um, more accuracy at the uh, inaccuracy at the detail level. And that's, that's not in health, that's in any sort of standard when you get into activity based costing, which is you're trying to, to get people to collect data at a very low level. You also ask, are asking sites for more information, which could create a lot less fine. So, for example, if you're wanting to micro, micro, micro cost, and that's requiring you to go to a site and have you know, 20 codes mm -hmm. instead of 10 codes and ask them to collect every single piece of workload for every single piece of patient, there's kind of a cost benefit. The more detailed you ask, you think you get better costing, but you have to be also be aware that people might just get fatigued by that and they just don't put accurate uh, detail in there anyway. So that's something that you need to be aware of. For costing to get much better model for the impact of evaluating changes in service delivery because it's patient by patient. Macro costing may in some cases be too high level for understanding the impact of changes within regions or sites um, because it's really, it may be too, too high to get a good benchmarking between sites or to actually know very much in detail that, for example, if you're doing tests, that what's the impact of change in the length of stay versus the impact of change in the cost of the supply and which gives you more value or bang for one buck. So the macro costing may not give you this in as much detail. Micro costing, um, you can, for example, get around some of the testing accuracies, et cetera, by using estimates and put workloads. Um, you can simplify the processes and use that same for macro costing. Um, micro costing, again, more detailed and has decisions. Average and standard on macro may not make for good decisions. Um, good impact on changes in delivery, and then in both micro-costing and macro-costing, you can use case and skirt CMG costing for procedure. You can do that in the micro and the macro. I did go into detail. Um, I think that Nathan might have covered that, some of that, but if not, you guys are welcome to ask questions um, after if you like. And then other considerations to think about when you're doing hospital costing, uh, very important is that you understand what is included in the cost. So for example, if you look at a patient cost or standard cost, you see that there are various costs that can go in there. So what's included? Is it all overhead? Is it incremental overhead? Is it just the direct cost? So what is in and what's out? That will be important for understanding how you're using the information if you're doing the evaluation. Understanding the methodology that's been used would be important. Important to understand the terminology and the definition so that if you're using it, that you understand what LOS is, that you understand RAW, DMG, that type of thing. And then it's also important that to remember that cost is always only <coughs> when you use any type of costing, any type of evaluation. And the most important thing is cost is really a, is one component to linking patient out, to linking into patient outcomes and quality, which should be really the driving force and the purpose of cost. In the end, it's just a participant in the ultimate goal, which is patient outcome, 
quality and quality, and those should be the driving forces. Um, the costing shouldn't necessarily be the driving force. And that's what I have. I want to say thank you, and I think from there, Jasmine, we're turning it over for questions. Yes, thank you very much, Lisa. Um, so I will welcome Nathan back up as well. Uh, at this time, like we did last session, we'll cut the live streaming for now just to allow people to ask frank questions. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you again to both of our speakers and thank you to our online audience. <laughs>